John York here. I'm going to cover on the business model canvas, broken into two sides, value and operations. Okay. And BMC covers nine different segments, and it's really a great tool because it covers, as we said, the value side and the value creation and value extraction side, which we will cover today. And then what we will do in a follow-on lecture is we will cover in the operations or efficiency side, which deals more with the cost. As a side note, we should also note that there's um, two additional segments you can add, and there is a canvas that has what we call the, the social value or the social impact and uh, as part of the business model canvas, and that is in uh, one of your Dropbox folders. But uh, many folks start with the base BMC to be able to put their ideas and their guesses and uh, what we call hypothesis in, and map it out, go talk to people, go collect some data, and find out whether your guesses are right or you need to pivot. You maybe change those guesses or those assumptions. So it's a scorecard. Now, the first segment on the right-hand side is customer segments. And segments of customers will vary. They'll vary depending on the offer, the channel, the relationships that you have with those customers, okay, uh, the profitabilities of those customers, and the willingness to pay for different aspects of the offer. And what I mean by that is some folks may just want to be freemium. Okay, we see this like in LinkedIn where you have the free but you have folks who will pay for premium. You also have folks on two-sided, so different types of relationships. So you may have folks like in um, Facebook who free, but also you have advertisers who pay. And there are different types, okay? You have mass market, and you have niche. Mass market are going to be your consumer products that you see out that are broadly distributed and advertised on TV. Okay, whereas they don't necessarily distinguish uh, specific customers as well as whereas niche markets actually start segmenting their customers. We see this particularly in special areas such as wine, especially high-end wines or jewelry. Um, segmented is where we start looking at slightly different needs and problems, and so we segment our customers based on um, different categories. Uh, segmenting could be like Toyota where they have different segments for Scion, which is a younger audience, uh, the traditional Toyota, which is a broader audience, and then for the more, um, I'm going to say, higher net worth individuals, you have Lexus. Diversified is where you have two unrelated segments with different needs and problems that are there. You see this in conglomerates, we see this in multi-sided situations, and then you have multi-sided, where you have two or more independent segments, such as in Facebook where you have advertisers and free, or in newspapers where you have advertisers and people who buy the newspaper, or you might see in terms of real estate, in terms of the buyer and the seller. So customers look in different ways, and as you see, we have multiple types of customers here, and I think a lot of folks just think the person who benefits is going to buy, and that can happen a whole lot of times. But in the business of business, you're going to have uh, maybe four or five different folk who are involved with that purchase decision process. So, uh, And this also happens with high ticket item products in families. So in this case where we're looking at um, a remodel, you may have the family that's going to benefit, but you may have various folks who are influencing that decision process. And you may have one core decision maker, like in my house, which is uh, the spouse. And you may have influencers such as you know, homeowners association, if you live in some type of um, uh, community that has an HOA or a gated community, or friends and family, etc., you may have a recommender that, or another type of influencer, such as an architect. And then last but not least, is you may have saboteurs to that process. You need to just be aware of that. And it does occur in terms of both B2B and B2C. Healthcare, what we think about is the patient. But in many ways, you may have with healthcare products, you're selling it to hospitals, you may have physicians, you may have laboratory um, uh, specialists that are involved, you may have hospital administrators and financial people are involved. And last but not least is 
you may have the ultimate payer, which is the insurance company, playing a role in decision of whether a product is accessible or not. So we're back to this thing called the BMC. It's a great canvas here, okay? Uh, what I wanted to point out here is relative to value is the whole thing tying customer to the value proposition, okay? We'll talk about operations later on, but the reality here is, is that we need to make sure that we're tying that value proposition back to the customer. So we need to think about the job to do, the tasks they're trying to perform, the problem to solve, and the needs to satisfy. So, you know, here's an example of e-commerce in terms of making uh, a quick and reliable way for customers to make purchases. And a good example is not just small e-commerce, but you have Amazon and Prime that have come out. So a marketing concept that we think about as we, we move forward with value propositions, think about the four Ps. And you'll see as we build out this whole uh, left, uh, right side of the canvas is uh, product in terms of that solution, okay? But it's also place, which is access, which is going to be your channels, and price, which is the value, which is going to be tying back in with your um, your revenue model, and then promotion, which is education, which gets into customer relationships, which we'll expand on a little later. So we've talked about the uh, value proposition canvas already, so I don't want to belabor it. Just to remember that you have the right side with the customer, and that the customer jobs to be done, that that they're very, very critical, and they're functional, social, personal, emotional, and supporting. And on the other side is you have products and services that you want to map to those job requirements. So you get your feature set that there. And, they, and remember, the products that are there can be physical, intangible, digital, or financial. And what I like to illustrate here when we think about value propositions is we're not talking about the features of the product. We're talking about why customers buy, getting into people's minds, okay? Uh, and people buy because they have needs. And this looks like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Actually, this is from Bain and Company from the Elements of Value, which was published in the Harvard Business Review. And those elements will be functional, personal saving of time, reducing risk, uh, getting information, okay, reduced effort to emotional in terms of reduced anxiety, to a badge value, okay? Uh, then you get to life changing, which is maybe affiliation of belonging, such as to a certain type of club, or uh, self-actualization in terms of achieving, uh, say, a black belt status in terms of Six Sigma, getting a certain degree in education. Um, or getting to the point of self-transcendence, such as Bill Gates has done with a foundation to help the world. So these are some things to think about in terms of when you create value propositions. What needs are you tying to? So this is something we will look towards and ask questions about. So then we get the channels, okay? And what's important about channels is that they are not the audio channels, okay, uh, that are on your TV. Uh, they are not the, the media channels we hear, and that's a lot of confusion we get with media channels versus distribution channels, uh, okay, or social media channels such as Facebook or Twitter. What I'm talking about are how we get this product to the customer. You can do it directly, okay, from your storefront or from your website. And we see this with the craft beer business, we see this at the wine business or through intermediaries, such as wholesalers or retailers or certain types of brokers. They allow for scaling, they allow for a few other things, but what we're looking to do is try to reach a broader audience more efficiently, building a brand. Justin Wine did this, Firestone did this, and these companies ended up selling, I think Justin sold for a few hundred million, I think Firestone was like 300 million, Ballast Point sold for a billion dollars because it built a broad-based reach and brand. And then physical is going to be, in terms of direct storefront, through a wholesaler. We see this in the, the alcohol and the pharmaceutical food and consumer business. And in alcohol in particular, we have to be mindful of the three-tier system uh, because the state laws that are there. Uh, digital, digital is 
the area that has dramatically changed, and we all in our own behavior have changed by embracing Amazon, for instance, as well as apps. Uh, and I work with a company that actually was um, delivering out an app to improve vision screening. And then um, your own website where you could have e-commerce. And there are benefits and costs to having channels. Those benefits that we think about can be anything from delivery stocking to inventory management. And particularly one of the things is that moving that inventory, holding that inventory, accounting, especially in the alcohol business in terms of accounting for tax purposes, marketing promotion is very, very critical. Running warehouse, for instance, over San Luis Obispo plays a role in terms of helping with making turns of major brands like ASICs and Adidas so that the velocity of the product movement in terms of the pull is greater. Uh, getting customer data to be able to improve marketing and uh, really at the end of the day train broader reach. But there are costs. And those costs are dollar costs. They can be anywhere from 20 to 60 percent and you have to make trade-offs. If you're going to extend your reach and move beyond say the innovator or niche audience uh, or to early adopters to now early majority, late majority, you need to think about that. And it allows you, it's going to be a cost to work through those intermediaries to be able to efficiently be able to do that. And you may also have control issues relative to inventory, promotion, uh, sell credit, Walmart, sometimes what they do with, with their um, their supply chain basically being companies selling through them is you don't get credit for the sale until that customer actually buys that product. Pretty scary. So one of the concepts that I try to bring forth relative to um, channels is a concept called push and pull. In other words, we have to load in and we have to provide incentives to the channel. Okay, either direct off invoice or incentive to load, incentive to, to be able to put in a premium place, below the line, above the line, shelf space, end caps, uh, even coupons, and then pull, which is our what we associate with traditional marketing uh, through TV, radio, social media to create demand. And sometimes a wholesaler does require that you have a certain amount of investment, and uh, the retailer has, and especially those large chains, that you have investment in terms of pull demand. That gets into this whole thing about customer relationships. And uh, this is an area that I see a lot of folks get wrong and really don't understand well. Uh, this is part of your go-to market. Very critical. Get, keep, and grow your customers. Okay? And get is very, very critical. Because what you need to do is you have to create awareness and then be able to help that customer on the customer journey through what we call the marketing funnel to interest, to consideration, and ultimately purchase, or AIDA you'll hear, which is interest and in information to demand or decision, and ultimately to uh, acquisition. And that is very critical in terms of the different things that you add in there from um, your broadcast type of activities which can be paid media, such as TV, radio, to earn, which could be like PR or social media, uh, to be able to help that customer move efficiently through this funnel. Two, then having various programs to keep that customer, because we know the cheapest customer you have is a customer you can actually keep. But ultimately, expanding and growing that customer with new offerings, unbundling, upselling, cross-selling, and asking for referrals. So what we're doing is we're maximizing the lifetime value of the customer because what we have to think about as a key metric is that, as well as the efficiency that we convert a customer, okay, from the group that we have aware to actually purchasing, that's funnel efficiency, the time of that efficiency in terms of the customer coming to that, to you. So you think about the time to first dollar, the time to first customer, and then last but not least is the cost to acquire a customer. The so last but not least we get into monetization. I love it. This is where we 
to make money, and there are different models. You can do the basic asset, selling the ownership rights to the product. But there are other things, such as a usage fee, and see subscription or fee for service that is there, um, such as a hotel night or a sub, um, subscription, which is a monthly membership fee, or um, lending or renting an asset, which would be using a, uh, an asset for a period for a fee. Other models include licensing, such as if you have intellectual property, can you license it out, e.g. copyright permission or a patent license. But then you can have broker fees, such as payment to a broker for uh, facilitating transaction, e.g. real estate is a one example, uh, stock assets are another. And then advertising, which is SEO and ads, which that's how Facebook is done. I think they did well over $20 billion in terms of revenue, and that's a major driver, to uh, two-sided or multi-sided, where the users may get for free, like with Facebook, but on the flip side, you may have Google AdWords and web placements uh, and retargeting programs that um, companies use and need to get at those customers so that they can get page one of a search engine or retargeting or seeing an ad because you visited a particular site. And the last but not least is tiered membership, which we see with LinkedIn, where um, with different levels of consumer participation, uh, free on the lower levels, but with greater service and greater, uh, I'm going to say, mix of fee, um, features and benefits, uh, you pay for higher service fees. We see that with a variety of SaaS models. And then other things that we need to think about, just revenue drivers. So, you know, when you have this model, you have to start thinking about how do I put together what we call a revenue model. And when we talk a little bit about this in terms of revenue models um, in one of the workshops, but, uh, you know, think about number of customers and then number of units per customer and the frequency of purchase and then the price per unit. And I'll close out with just pricing, which is, you know, it's just don't throw a single your dollar value there, but there's a, a variety of different models from fixed pricing in terms of list price to feature dependent to segment dependent in terms of types and characteristics of a customer segment to volume dependent, okay, in terms of uh, customers who are large buyers will get a certain amount of discount. Uh, segment dependent might be um, I'll give you an example, if you sell into a hospital versus if you sell into retail um, in, with a, within the drug business. Negotiation is price negotiated between two partners, such as in real estate. Yield management is another pricing, which is, this is dynamic pricing we're talking about, which is morally driven by the market, such as um, a time of purchase and inventory. I love Uber as a very good example in terms of demand. Uh, and then, uh, again, price in terms of supply and demand, and auctions in terms of competitive bidding. So this gives you some sense of how to think through how you price, how to build a revenue model, but also the other pieces that you need to think about the value of creation. So hopefully this helped out. This is under 20 minutes, but it will at least give you in perspective in terms of how to think about the BMC from the value side.